NHL fans or just sports fans are funny. As soon as we see a trade announced, we love to declare a winner on day one, which oftentimes results in many fans absolutely clowning on certain GMs. Even though we don't truly know who won the trade for sometimes years. I mean, hey, just take a look at Mark Bergevin, the burger man, goofed for trading PK. That worked out. Goofed on trading Alex Galchenyuk for Max Domi. Anderson looks great this year, while Galchenyuk and Domi struggle. The man was even criticized for taking Alexander Romanov in the second. How did that turn out? I guess the point is, Burgerman gets goofed on right away for his trades. But when you look back and actually analyze those events, yeah he's made some blunders, but Montreal is looking like a wagon in the north. So I mean, who's laughing now? So instead, let's take a look at the actual bad GMs and go over their absurd track records that literally left their franchise in ruins. Peter. Oh Peter, Peter. Honestly guys, at this point I feel like I have beaten the wheels of Peter Shirelli. But trust me on this, in fact, buckle up. It gets worse. Much, much worse. In April 2015, the Edmonton Oilers, after five years of complete and utter disappointment, would trade a 2017 second round pick for Peter Shirelli, which actually turned out to be Jack Studnicka, who looks like a potential top six player. The Oilers even lost a good prospect just for hiring the guy. And even though he probably wanted to draft Dylan Strome, or probably Pavel Zaka with the first overall pick, believe it or not, he would in fact draft Connor McDavid. Oof, we got that out of the way, but it wasn't that easy. Peter Shirelli's first big move, his first trade as an Edmonton Oiler, was to trade the Matt Barzell pick for a clearly non-NHL ready Griffin Reinhardt. Not to mention that months before the draft, Edmonton would shockingly trade Jeff Petrie for virtually nothing. Good start. It's only up from here. Failure. Okay, the Oilers are still at the bottom of the league, but it's safe to say after drafting Jesse Poyarvi, as early as next year with the right moves, Edmonton can be a serious contender. Justin Schultz for a third. W what? Peter, we, we need defense. We can't just keep playing Connor 30 minutes a game and win by scoring. Okay, but little did you know, this was all part of Peter Shirelli's master plan. So now to replenish their defense, Shirelli expected Griffin Reinhardt to be that guy. But things didn't turn out. So in a mad scramble, they would trade Taylor Hall one for one for Adam Larson. Don't get me wrong, Adam Larson is a great piece for Edmonton, but for Taylor Hall, it, it just never made sense. And of course the next season, he would win MVP of the NHL. And yes, Edmonton arguably has better defense, but they're now missing that supplementary scoring that McDavid needs. So, how did he replace that scoring? Obviously a big signing for the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, you know, there's a lot of familiar, familiarity there with me and, and Milan. <laughs> Milan Lucic, signing a seven year, $42 million contract. You know how good depth is needed for winning a cup? Well, instead, we get Milan Lucic. The next season, the Nail Yakupov era would come crashing down as he'd be shipped off to St. Louis. But hey, the Oilers would make it to the second round. Now, if we just keep building, some good smart signings, some trades, Edmonton is looking good. Except, the Oilers would do virtually nothing. Shirelli would ship off Eberle in a disaster deal for Ryan Strom. At the time, they needed that secondary scoring and decided to, to downgrade, and Shirelli would do nothing in the next two seasons besides minor deals. None of his draft picks would turn out, he refused to trade draft picks for actual line mates for McDavid, and so Edmonton was basically forced to load up their first line and hope they can outscore the other team. Peter would then sign Mikko Koskinen to a very risky contract, which I mean has turned out okay, but just the risk factor and the rationale points towards his questionable decision making. Remember how they traded Everly for Ryan Strom? Well, they would trade Strom for Spooner, who was so bad that he literally left Russia the next year. 
That's Peter Shirelli logic for you guys. Let's trade a 20-30 goal scorer and end up with a KHL player. Awesome. And as a final nail in the coffin, Peter Shirelli would trade Drake Kajula, one of their only decent secondary scorers, and more importantly, McDavid's best friend. But he would trade him for the man who ended McDavid's rookie season. You can't make this stuff up, and they just send Manning down to the minors anyways. So here is the final picture. This is what they traded, but this is what they got in return. And what is so ironic, everything that they traded away is exactly what they need today. Jeff Petrie, a right-handed shot two-way defenseman in Norris discussion. Barzell, as an Oilers fan, I can't even imagine. Taylor Hall, same thing. Even Jordan Everly. Besides the number one goaltender, everything Edmonton needed was literally on their team and they traded them for, for nothing. Back in the 1980s, the New York Islanders led by Hall of Famers Mike Bossy, Brian Trottier, Dennis Potvin, were one of the best assembled teams in NHL history. This stat says it all. They won the Stanley Cup four years in a row, on top of having a 19 game winning streak in the playoffs. Like, come on, they are the definition of a dynasty. So heading into the 90s, there was an expectation of a rebuild. You can't win that much without eventually coming down. So cue Mike Milbury. After a chaotic NHL career, including beating the wheels off a fan beside a cop in the stands, Milbury would be hired as head coach in 1996. Hold up, after three months on the job, he would also take over as coach and GM. This is gonna definitely end well. One of the first trades he would make was actually pretty good, as he would acquire Berard from Ottawa, and he turned into a solid player. He would draft the Wongo fourth overall in 1997, but it's okay. Milbury would end up trading the Wongo and Oyokinen, who keep in mind, ended up being a 90 point scorer, and one of the worst trades in NHL history. And that is because he drafted Rick DiPietro first overall and felt no need to keep Bobby Lou. Yep, you, get, get, shoo, get out of here. And speaking of our boy Rick, he would get one of the biggest goalie contracts in NHL history. Because after having one decent season, Gar Snow would ink him to a 15 year, $67.5 million contract. And speaking of bad contracts, after stealing Sedano Chara in the third round of the draft, Chara was slowly showing he had superstar upside. I mean, the man was six foot nine, but Milbury wanted to win, even though they clearly weren't ready. And let's be honest, they would have surely benefited from letting their young players develop. So he would trade Chara alongside pick number two in the draft, which turned out to be Jason Spezza for Alexi Yashin. Not a terrible deal, but at the age of 29, let's give him a 10 year, $90 million contract. And with inflation, Melbury gave out a $140 million contract. So the biggest contract in NHL history. Now, don't get me wrong. Yashin was a great player, but he wasn't even close to being the best player in the league. But he was paid like Wayne Gretzky. And of course, he wouldn't even come close to living up to that massive contract. And you know how I mentioned how the team wasn't even ready for a player like Yashin? Forcing him into the lineup would make them a competitive team, but they would win a total of five playoff games in a five year span, as they would get spanked in the first round every year. And instead of having a Hall of Famer in Zidane Chara and a young superstar to build around in Spezza, the Islanders had a $140 million injury prone, regressing Yashin, who'd even leave in year five of his 10 year contract, basically dooming the entire franchise. But it's okay, what about the other talent? Tom Bertuzzi, a promising young power forward, Brian McCabe, a number one defenseman. Yeah, how about we trade them for a heavily regressing Trevor Linden? And of course, Bertuzzi would soon develop into a 50 goal premier power forward. Whereas they would have to trade Trevor Linden the next season for a draft pick that didn't even turn out. Remember how I said Berard was a great deal and a great start to his tenure? Psych! 
Let's trade him once again for an aging veteran and Felix Poppin. And honestly, I don't even know what to say. Milberry would trade away several Hall of Famers, and in return, he would basically just give away hundreds of millions in contracts to players who could never live up to them. The best way to describe Milberry's tenure is just horribly timed decision making. Whereas on the other hand, Peter Shrelly was just trading away every asset that they'd eventually need. And so I guess the question is, who did a worse job? Here is what Milberry did. But here is what Shirelli did. Comment down below who did a worse job. Now I will say, there is a silver lining. Milberry would eventually get picked up by the NBC crew, where he would go on to having a great broadcasting career. <sighs> oh boy. 